Greetings! Welcome to the Sci-Fi Pubcast, the podcast that tries to be a pub, and perhaps someday a pub that tries to be a podcast. As always, we are looking for customers to come visit the bar. So if you're passionate about something and you want to be on a podcast, well, let us know, because this bar is all about community. If you want to help us out, please consider leaving a five-star review wherever you find the show, joining our Discord server, and subscribing to our YouTube channel. We're back! Yes, we did... We were there last month, now we're back again. Yes, blame everything on me. My name is Joel. I'm the owner of the Sci-Fi Pubcast, so to speak. And I've made a really bad life choice of going back to do a PhD at law school. So I'm busy. Probably actually a good choice uh, in the, you know, uh, given time. But uh, it means I uh, have less time for podcasting, which is a fortunate. But, mm. uh, but I'm looking around at the bar today and we have a full complement crew Back for this show, we have Carrie Simpson, Derek Beebe, and Dr. Renner Graham, author of Before Life and Afterlife Crisis. Hi, everyone. Hey. Hi. Hey. I mean, I mean, you are you are the odor and stuff, so it is so it is always your fault anyway. Exactly. You know, it's you know, I pay for everything. I edit. I, I you know, I, I keep the the, uh, the stock you know, <clears throat> on the shelves. Such is life. Uh, I think yeah. I've lost more hair, but that's good. Uh, it's uh, we're recording at the very, very end of January. Uh, I'm in Ottawa, uh, not Ottawa. Yeah, it feels like Ottawa. I, I'm in uh, London, Ontario, Canada, right now. We've been in a deep freeze. We're te- still technically on a lockdown until probably tomorrow when uh, some of the regulations are loosened up. Uh, but uh, besides that, my head space is all about space law at the moment. Ask me anything, folks, because I will probably know it. Or space law. Space law, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. and mostly the answer always is, of course, it depends, especially in space. But yeah, there you go. Uh, Any which way, uh, Carrie, how's life in Southern California? Um, it's it's nice. It's it's warming up a bit. Um, it's getting a bit, a bit chilly at night, but yeah, you know, I say chilly. That's Cal. That's LA chilly. Not um, not you know. Canadian or Pennsylvania chili, so it's actually probably on the warm side for you guys. But yeah, yeah I'm I'm drinking a tequila and tonic. Why? Because the tequila was in front of the gin. <laughs> I love good, a good tequila. There's nothing better. Yes, definitely. And uh, Derek, man, how's the the hills of Pennsylvania treating you? We're also pretty cold. I think we had negative twenty wind chills the other night. Mm. We, we did manage to avoid most of that big nor'easter, though, because apparently there were record high snowfalls in New York City and Philadelphia of like 15 inches, but I only got a couple. Mm-hmm. Any uh, Bigfoot sightings from last week or two? No, not that okay. I'm aware of. Yeah. I don't think there's Bigfoot in Pennsylvania. Uh, do they have another name for it? You know, like, and that's Swamp Ape, that's Florida. Uh, so there's, that's there's the Jersey mm-hmm. Devil in New Jersey, but that's not a Bigfoot. That's kind of like more of a demonic entity. Okay. He yeah. kind of looks, I think he looks more like Spring Hill Jack from uh, England in the 1800s. Yeah, okay, fair Maybe enough. Uh, if like a Yeti suddenly shows up, like uh, keep us informed, okay? And, and take gotcha. a picture with your smartphone, right? There's a camera on your <laughs> phone nowadays, right? Use that, just say. That's what everybody forgets to do. <laughs> Uh, but speaking of weird stuff, how's our kitchen doing, Derek? Well, as you recall, we were away for a few months earlier, and when I came back in there, the rats had achieved sentience and were operating the kitchen on themselves and had things nice and clean. And one of them was even doing a ratatouille deal with me where he was pulling on my hair and teaching me how to cook. Well, unfortunately, we were gone for a few more months, and when we came back this time, all the rats had died, unfortunately. I, I guess they had starved or something, and uh, one of them had a little tiny magical amulet around its neck, and there was a little tiny note to it that said it will give you magical powers if you show courage, but unfortunately, I have not been able to get it to work no matter what I do. Huh. I can't imagine why. Yeah, I, I, I don't get it. I uh, consider myself courageous, but apparently the lock is more picky. I just want to say, you know, listen, man, we all need therapy. There, there's no uh, you know, negativity to that, okay? <laughs> there's no dishonor. <laughs> just, yeah. so, so expect the quality of the cooking to go down a little bit now because I don't have my assistant chef with me anymore. So yeah, we, but, we're back to OG. Yeah, so no rats. Uh, How is the cockroach situation then? I think the cockroaches ate the rats. And, ah. and then ate themselves. 
Right. Okay. Wow. Uh, okay. There we go. Uh, yes. Yes. And of course, uh, we have a special uh, casual uh, friend of the show, loyal supporter, uh, extraordinaire, and my PhD supervisor, uh, Dr. Randall Graham. There you go. <laughs> glad, you, <laughs> glad, glad you can join us again. <laughs> Yeah, good to see you. I am less well prepared for this show than I than I am sometimes when I come on when I pour over the show notes and read lots of background information about what we're going to be discussing because I spent this morning reading a paper by Joel Welch. I know, so sorry. You can, you can blame him. It was actually very good. I, I I don't mean to be insulting by using the word actually there. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's great, but it was it was surprisingly good for uh, um, for a, a, an introductory graduate piece that is supposed to be a literature review of existing literature on space law and law and literature and whatnot. It was really really well done. If you don't mind me uh, um, tooting your horn on uh, a podcast, yeah, thanks. Only three and a half years to go, and uh, I have to get through my coursework first. But uh, yeah, things are happening. I'm trying to use my brain as much as possible and trying to ask the big important ideas yeah, without losing my sanity. That's important. <laughs> uh, so now uh, in Canada, it is legal and morally acceptable for you guys to toot each other's horns, right? <laughs> oh God! Uh, yes. yes. <laughs> that's, that's it. Uh, some, in some parts of America, that's looked down on. But I'm, I'm glad that Canada is more progressive than we are. Oh God! Uh, so uh, let's just move on. Okay, <laughs> Reno, what's happening in your life, sir? And the other uh, other than reading PhD stuff, um, I had a, a weird combo of uh, multicultural events this weekend because, um, as you know, Tuesday is uh, the dawn of the year of the tiger. And uh, this past Tuesday was Robbie Burns Day. And uh, I deferred my Robbie Burns celebration by several days and advanced Chinese New Year by a few days. And we had a combo party last night. And by party, I mean myself, my wife and my father-in-law, because that's our COVID bubble. <laughs> And uh, we sat and had, uh, um, you know, beef pot pies, whiskey, and Chinese food. <laughs> so, Very it was nice. A lovely combo. That's Very awesome. I'm sorry to say I don't know who Robbie Burns is. Oh God. Oh goodness gracious me! Oh. He is uh, um, the the most famous Scotsman, really. Um, at least uh, he's the most celebrated uh, native son of of Scotland. And it's lovely to have a country whose most celebrated native son was a poet, rather than you know some sort of military dude. Um, but yeah, he was a poet. He wrote, uh, you'd probably know Old Lang Syne, um, mm. the song that everybody sings on New Year's Eve incorrectly. And yes. uh, um, <laughs> also uh, addressed to the Haggis. Um, lots of uh, um, poetry for which he was famous. He started writing when he was 15 years old and died at 37. But in the meantime, created this uh, large body of, um, of uh, sort of homespun poetry that uh, um, is much beloved. Uh, as we can tell, Europe looking around here, only the everybody. good die young. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, apparently he also toured Europe impregnating everybody um, for much <laughs> of his life and, and died penniless. Um, so, you know, live fast, die young, I guess. <laughs> oh, God. And I also had haggis last week, so uh, haggis is good. Yeah. We need more haggis. Has it cleared now. up now? Did you get a treatment? Yeah, I, I did. I'm good. It, it's it's, it's passed, so uh, definitely a bowel movement or two there. But, uh, yeah, really good stuff. Oh, nice. <laughs> <Okay>. uh. <laughs> All right. A stronger drink. <laughs> All right, but we're not here to talk about Haggis, are we? No, no, we're talking about uh, the Marvel Cinematic Universe uh, movie that came out in August of 2021, Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. That's right, that's right. Directed by Justin Daniel Creighton and starring Simu Liu. Simu Liu. Simu. Wait. Oh, I don't know. Okay, listen. We. I'm going to mispronounce these these names. Okay, I'm going to try my best. I've been studying YouTube, and I'm still going to mispronounce these names uh, because they're Asian names and mostly Chinese names in particular. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm doing my best. We on the show mean no disrespect if we butcher the names. We're we're doing our best. But uh, yeah, starring uh, Simu Liu. Um, uh, the woman's name is Aquafana. Aquafina. 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 Uh, she's a, a stand up comedian, right? Or is that her yeah. background? Yeah. Uh, yeah, she's been in a lot of comedy movies and she also has a Comedy Central show. Oh, who knew? Uh, uh, Tony Chan Wee Lung. So, uh, and there's a few others. And that's it. So, uh, 
Yeah, uh, Renal brought up this idea of doing this film. Uh, we missed it uh, back in the summer because of my crazy life. And uh, I actually and quite, COVID. And COVID, there's that. I actually quite enjoyed this film. I actually went to the cinema and saw it uh, when the cinemas were open during like the in-between waves of COVID stuff. And I, I quite enjoyed it. I think it was very well done, well written, and I really liked the Asian flair to it. Mm -hmm. uh, let's Agreed. Uh, uh, well, let's start with Reynolds since uh, it was his uh, his topic idea. Reynolds, what are your uh, first impressions of this film? Uh, I really enjoyed it. And part of that, uh, I suspect, is expectations management. When you're not expecting that you're going to love something and it comes out and it's way better than you thought, it uh, really um, doubles down on the enjoyment. Um, I, uh, I, I always fear... Um, my enjoyment, I have to admit this, guys, my enjoyment of superhero movies and, and TV properties and whatnot has been diminishing over the last couple of years as I become increasingly um, annoyed by people who solve problems by putting on spandex and punching each other. Um, <laughs> it's just that, you know, you, you see it a million times in a million different ways. And it just um, I, I don't know, I'm, I'm a little saturated by that. But uh, um, and this film, I was sort of expecting it to end like um, some Star Wars films. End, and that is just, you know, a bunch of pixels fighting other pixels. Um, just a great big CGI fest. Um, but I, I was really, I found the narrative quite touching. I found the story building and world building interesting and lovely. I found the departures from the comic books interesting and, and, and well thought out. Um, I cared about the characters. I thought that was interesting. Um, I'm also, I, I, I really you know, mildly enthralled with the way Simu Liu um, essentially manifested this movie by tweeting out, um, you know, some years ago, I want to play this character. And they're like, there's not even a movie for that. But boom, now there is. <laughs> um, uh, I thought, you know, if only we could all be as focused and dedicated as he is. And I loved him in Kim, Kim's Convenience. And uh, when I saw that he was going to be this character, I thought that was fantastic. And, you know, I had all the fears that one might have when one is a child of the 70s and grew up during the uh what was the the karate and kung fu craze of the 1970s right when everything was about martial arts and remember karate kid in dc was supposed to be the the only non-powered human who could ever fight superman to a standstill just because he's so good at karate and like it, it was just bonkers the extent to which comic books and media and they were all the ninja movies of the 1980s and it was super cheesy and really sort of cultural appropriation up the wazoo. And then this movie just handled it so deftly in my estimation. Um, I thought it was, was really well done, really enjoyable, charming um, in a way that superhero movies usually aren't and uh, endearing and fun with uh, just enough fan service with characters like Wong and um, Captain Marvel and others. And uh, I, I love Ben Kingsley in this movie. A lot of good stuff to say about this film. I should mention. Probably Reynolds. should have mentioned that we were spoiling the crap out of this. I just want to mention here that yes, uh, we're going to be talking spoilers. So uh, yeah, if you haven't seen this movie, perhaps you should before listening to this podcast. Such as the life in a bar. But uh, let's turn to like uh, Carrie. So what's your worth, your initial thoughts about this movie? Well, I I did not see this until it came out on Disney Plus because it came out while you know COVID was very much on, still on the rise in the middle of summer last year. Uh, uh, I really liked it. I liked, I liked the, the martial arts philosophy. I, I liked the, um, I liked the characters. I love Katie. Katie is fabulous, but Aquafina is fabulous anyway. Um, <laughs> the, the whole, the whole dynamic between, between her and uh, Shang she was just awesome. Mm. Uh, I did not expect uh, Ben Kingsley to be in the movie as much as he was. I pretty much left him up for dead after um, Hell to the King. But having, I did not, I, so I did not expect him to survive the, the movie, which was awesome. Uh, I, I have seen a bit few complaints about... Um, as Randall would term it, the CG fest with the final battle at the end, like we, like we thought this was going to be like just you know a personal you know one on one person versus person story, and it ended up being you know two CGI monsters fighting each other while 
um, everyone else tries to bring down the the bad one, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, but I I did not I did I I liked that that part. I was I was all for it, um, especially the um, as a friend of mine put it, the Falcor esque uh, <laughs> image of of Shang and his sister riding the dragon. That was great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Before we go all smog here, uh, just uh, and we turn to Derek. I uh, just want to say, uh, <laughs> "All Hail the King" was a uh, short from 2014, which you can watch on Disney Plus, which deals with uh, the, the Trevor Slattery character, which is the actor who. Uh, uh, no, that, that's actually the actor, actually who's the character. So the Ben Kinsley person uh, who uh, played the fake Mandarin in uh, what Iron Man one and three. Iron Man three. Yeah. So, so it's actually well, well worth going back. This is like 12 minutes or 15 minutes. So it's a short, and it's yeah, it's in, it informs what happens in this movie to a certain degree. I think that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was great. Yeah, I, I I got something to say about the dragons and the end sequence, the CGI. But before I do that, I'll turn to Derek to get his initial thoughts. Derek, man, what do you think? So I think out of the four of us, I'm I'm the biggest uh, MCU nerd, probably. I think, mm-hmm. and I've I've read a lot of the Marvel comics and stuff, and. When this was first announced as a movie, my expectations were very low because from what I know of him in the comic books, he's a D-list character who has no powers. He's literally just a guy who knows martial arts. So I was like, how in the world is that going to make an interesting movie within the MCU next to Iron Man and Captain America and Thor and everything? So at, at that point, it was one of those things. This was prior to the Fox sale when they got control of the X-Men and the Fantastic Four. So at that point, it was like, oh, man, this is what they're down to. They're doing Shang-Chi and the Eternals. And it's like, can't, you know, like, can't, don't you have better properties you can be doing right now? So this is basically at the bottom of my anticipation list. And then they announced that it was called Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings and that they were bringing in the Mandarin. And then I got excited. Because, like, oh, man, that's great. Because, I mean, Iron Man 3 was a cool twist and everything. But the Mandarin is one of the greatest MCU villains. And they basically, you know, did a bait and switch with him in Iron Man 3 after setting him up in Iron Man 1. And then in Hail of the King, they established that, yes, there there really is a Mandarin in real life that does exist. So, yeah, I was uh, my my excitement for the character was very low initially. But then when I found out it was going to be a Mandarin movie, I got very excited because that's great. They're finally going to deliver on the promise that the Iron Man franchise petered out on as much as I love Trevor Slattery and everything. So that was great. So I went into it with slightly higher expectations at that point. But I still thought it was ultimately going to be like a middle of the road MCU movie. And the trailers looked cool and everything. And, you know, it was like, oh, hopefully it'll be fun. And well, what I got in the theater was vastly better than what I expected it to be. The Not only were the fight scenes super cool, not only was Shang-Chi a great, fun character, but uh, we got the Mandarin. We got a ton of Trevor Slattery. Like, like Carrie said, I thought he was going to be like a cameo. I thought he'd be in it for like 30 seconds and get killed off or something. So yeah. him having a major role was awesome. And I had no idea that the entire third act was going to be in this like Narnia like fantasy world. And there's going to be this huge epic battle at the end. So that, that was something that was not spoiled in the advertising, which I'm very glad they chose to do. So that was a really big, pleasant surprise. The scope and the scale of the movie was so much more than what I thought it was going to be. So I, I ultimately ended up enjoying it a lot and all the supporting characters were really good too. It was kind of like when I went in to go see black Panther I thought, okay, this will be a a cool movie, but it's it's a solo series, so it can only, I don't know, like to me, when it just stars one person, it can only be so exciting. But both Black Panther and Shang-Chi both had this great supporting cast of characters, other other people who could, you know, hold their own stories because they have powers and stuff. So like Black Panther, this really exceeded my expectations. It was a lot of fun. I, I do have issues with the third act ultimately becoming yet another disposable cgi monster battle but aside from that great movie tons of fun cool and let's just speak to i am all for cgi monster battles by the way <laughs> <laughs> yeah, especially when it's two dragons right or one dragon and one a dragon monster. and a, a, a soul sucking demon, demon soul sucking 
like demon of darkness tentacle monster type thing yeah yeah it's very much the the you know the, the, the yin and the yang it, it's Taoism, right the Tao Te Ching all mm -hmm. of that stuff there's mm -hmm. balance and you have to find it and everything is changing the river is always flooring differently right each time you step mm -hmm. in it and so oh, yeah. so it's this this back and forth which is you know it's part of this aesthetic to this film because it's Asian right you see this in the architecture of, of the village of uh was it Tao uh, Talu, Talo, Talo, and, and, and all of that. I just I love like listen. If I have an Eastern philosophy, I really really enjoy is Taoism, right? The yin and the yang, right? And, well, the yeah. the Taoism starts from the beginning of the film because if the that first fight between um um the Mand uh, Mandarin um uh, Wu, uh Wen Wu and, and Lee, it's like that is you know hard versus soft you know light versus dark he's he's open open fist versus closed fist uh and and i was the last time i watched the movie is like i was you know you notice like lee lee isn't actually fighting him mm -hmm. she's just letting him fight himself and yeah. she's like the conduit for him to fight himself and that that's that was really really cool to to watch and then um Towards the end of the movie, when when Michelle uh, when uh, Yin uh, Nan is training uh, Shang, you know she she opens his hand and it's like, yeah, the more you grip, the harder you grip on you you tighten your grip, um, the easier it is for you to to lose what you're working on. And I we I don't know that seems to sound a bit familiar. Um, yeah. I don't know why. Yeah, exactly. Most you know, martial arts. The more like, you tighten your grip, the more <laughs> things will slip through your fingers. I don't know. Yeah. It, 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 that, yeah. that seems to be a valid <laughs> argument. Yeah. Quite frankly, going back to Reynolds said about the, the Kung Fu craze of the 70s and 80s, I was part of it as a kid. So uh, I, I'm just ecstatic, ecstatic that there's like a training sequence in this film. I like films with training mm -hmm. sequences because I don't. It's just it's a trope which I quite enjoy. Right. Either military, uh, you know, aspect of you know training, or it's a martial art aspect. It's the, or you know, it's Return of the Jedi uh, or Empire Strikes Back, I should say, with Luke being taught by Yoda. It, it, it's stuff like that. I really enjoy for some strange reason. I mean, oh, oh yeah, yeah. And then, and then, of course, the Fight Club, which was <laughs> just cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, all those movies of the nineteen eighties uh, and nineties are are why to this day, whenever I need to learn something and learn it quickly i always turn to my wife and say i need a montage <laughs> <laughs> uh, so true uh you mentioned the, the fight club scene right so who do we have here we have wong which is a great mcu character he's one he's in my top five list of people i love in the mcu fighting abomination which is from the first hulk movie uh, of the mcu the very first mcu yes. movie right the only well, the only second. Hulk movie. Second. Second. second yeah, movie. Yeah, played by Tim Roth, I believe. Yeah. But, yeah. So, uh, and Wong and Abomination is doing some sort of a uh, you know, scam or they're playing, uh, you know, the, the bookies. Well, it's, it? it seems like they, it seems like this is something they do quite frequently. And I know that Abomination is going to be making an appearance and I think she Hulk. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Um, I, I can't really discuss Wog without discussing spoilers for Spider Man. So yeah, yeah. Um, I I just find I just find Wong's particip. Uh, let's just say I find Wong's participation in the Fight Club, given his current position in the MCU, uh, very interesting. I, mm -hmm. I I don't know if he's tried to you know do that to um, ignore what Stephen Strange is doing or not, but. You know, whatever whatever uh, helps alleviate stress, right? Yeah, so. My interpretation of that scene was that he was letting Abomination out of jail for like a little bit of recreational activity. And then because when he puts him through the portal and sends him back through, it looks like he's sending him into like a military base or something. So mm -hmm. I, I, I interpreted that as he was just letting Abomination out of his prison cell for a little bit of fun and then putting him back in. Right, right. Yeah. To I try and rehabilitate him. I recommend this YouTube channel, Screen Crush, and uh, Ryan Ayers, I think the guy's name, who does these videos. Uh, it, it, he really drives deep into it and drills down to the nitty gritty and uh, very, very knowledgeable about pop culture. So, uh, Screen Crush, look it up. 
Okay. It's, it's, it's a commercial, you know, business establishments. So they, they're there for, to make money, of course, but uh, they know what they're talking about. And they, and it's funny. Uh, saying about funny things, uh, I don't know. There's also the bus fight scene, which is a lengthy scene. The first very, like, big fight scene uh, in the present day in San Francisco, going down the hills. Uh, we are introduced to the character uh, Razor, not Razor Crust, but Razor Guy. Fist. Fist, yeah. Fist. Yeah. Has nothing to do with the Mandalorian. Uh, so. <laughs> it's on his license plate. <laughs> What did you guys make of that uh, fight se- sequence? For me, my favorite thing about that, I don't know if this was intentional. Like, I, I don't know this genre like a, a tenth as well as, as Carrie would know it or, or like most people even. But um, it just screams Jackie Chan to me. Like, it was, just looked like such <laughs> yeah. a huge tribute to Jackie Chan, the whole scene. And yeah. it, I, think sort of like, I think they mentioned that as doing a tribute to Jackie Chan. Oh, that that is very cool because it was like, what happened if Jackie Chan was in the Captain America elevator scene, and 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 and, and, and <laughs> this was it, and it was so it's a bus, and it was just amazing. I love that scene. And I think Simu Liu is trying to get Jackie Chan into like the next movie or something because why the heck not? <laughs> I just yeah, that was amazing. I loved it, and I, I loved the reaction of his friend, who's like, "Who the hell are you? Like, I, you can do all this stuff." <laughs> I thought that was great. I'd been filmed by some influencer, you know, you know, posting it live to YouTube or whatever, right? Or on social media. I love how uh, he, the main character, right, turns to his, uh, again, names. Sorry. Uh, was it Katie? Right? Okay. Katie. Uh, okay. Wait, for, wait for, the, for the signal. What's the signal? And then later on, he hits the best stop. <laughs> Indicator. <Yeah. laughs> That's I thought, great. I, I, Super cute. <laughs> I will say, and I, I've said this on, on, on another podcast already, but the guy filming the bus fight has all of the energy of the people who comment on my teacher's uh, Facebook feed <laughs> or, or, or um, Instagram feed. Yeah. With um, he's just you know, our, it's like yeah, I took I took martial arts for a couple of months, so now I, now I'm an expert, so I'm going to film this and, and comment on on what's going on, <laughs> like. Yeah. yeah uh, you... Okay. Whatever you say, dude. <laughs> oh man. Uh, you know. Yeah, I think the bus fight is is my favorite sequence in the whole movie. It's it's certainly not the biggest one, but it's just so amazing and cool, and the way they did it, and a lot of it in one shot, and it, it was just fun and eye popping. It was a really good show off for Simulio's talents. And you can see it. And it was funny. Yeah, it was funny. And you can see. I mean, if you're going to rip the band-aid off. And reveal who you are to you know your best friend. You might just might as well just you know make it as impressive as, as possible, right? Yeah, you should do it by two by kicking two people at the same time, in yeah, the opposite directions, <laughs> yeah, and then like tug your jacket afterwards. Yeah, yeah. So on Disney oh. on Disney Plus, there's some extra features, and the one filming of documentary, which is a short documentary, they spend uh, a good portion of it uh, showing how the bus sequence was done. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. definitely worth checking out. Yep. So, uh, what else? What was really imp- impressed me, and I timed this, and I went back to make sure I got this right. For the first ten minutes and forty-five seconds of this movie, uh, you don't hear English. Everything is is uh, the narrative is in in, uh, in, uh, in, in Chinese. Chinese. Mandarin. Yeah, in Mandarin. Yeah. Okay, and with subtitles. And it's only when we get to San Francisco is the first English line spoken. I think that was really well. I love well. that. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, and of course the whole like the whole like uh, Chinese mythical creatures. I, mm-hmm. I used to play Dungeons and Dragons when I was a kid a lot, and I remember there was an Asian version of this, so we were playing Asian stuff. It was either like Japan or China, so we, there was a book with all these uh, myth mythical uh, Asian creatures and I just love that. That's great. I also play Star Trek role playing too. Don't blame me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, I, I really liked some of the uh, the retconning that they did with this uh, character and this whole series of stories yeah. um, to make it, well, A, just more of the current times than mm-hmm. of the 1970s martial arts craze. Like, um, I didn't read Shang-Chi 
as a comic book. And uh, I was, however, as a kid, aware of Dr. Fu Manchu. And I had no idea that Fu Manchu was originally Shang-Chi's dad. Um, and that because he was sort of problematic in terms of Asian stereotypes, that he'd been essentially retconned out of the universe. That coupled with the fact that Marvel lost the rights to the guy. Um, <laughs> and uh, so they, they changed Shang-Chi's parentage. And I just thought that was really interesting. I had no idea. I mean, making him related to the Mandarin, which I don't remember. If I I'm not as familiar with with Marvel comics as Derek That's for or the movie. other people. It is that yeah. is for the movie? So yeah. I I think I think that 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 you know connects the universe a bit more. And there's there are a couple of rumor there are a couple of theories going around about where the Ten Rings came from, that tie into the Eternals possibly, um, which could be very interesting if those turn out to be true. In the comics, the the Ten Rings originally came from aliens, didn't they? They were alien technology. Yeah, well, and, they're well, from. Go ahead. No, go ahead, De Derek. You uh, know. They're 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 Ten Rings from the Makluins, which are these giant dragon aliens. Fing Fang Foom is one of them. So they're uh, yeah, there there's there's ten different rings, and each one has a different superpower. Like one is invisibility, one is mind control, one is force blast. You know things like that, and. Yeah, they, they come from the Macluins, which are these gigantic dragon-like alien beings. Yeah, and then there, without without giving without spoiling um, Eternals too much, there's a theory going around that 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 the Ten Rings were a prototype Fastos was working on, um, because you know Ten Rings, Ten Eternals, you do the math. Yeah, yeah. You know, one for each of them. Yeah, the whole Galactica uh, hypothesis. There's that. In the post-credits scene, we learn that uh, you know this beacon. Uh, uh, there's a beacon from the rings going out, right? When it was, was used for the first time by Simu, Simi, Say his name for me. Simu Liu. Simu, Simu Liu. Liu. Simu Liu. Okay, and see, so it's sending a message to what to where. That's uh, you know is to be uh, determined. Well, but, I yeah. I wonder if that if that was tied to coincide with a specific thing in Eternals, with it, which again, I'm not going to mm, spoil, yes. but interesting. Yes. But yeah. Hmm. I heard thing is just going to the Macluins and that the sequel is going to be about them and Fing Fang Foom, but we'll see. Interesting. Uh, of course, uh, this karaoke, uh, that's not a stereotype, is it? But it worked, right? Uh, Hotel California. Anyone? Sure. I mean, why not? And, and, and you know, Wong, again, Wong looks like he could use a vacation. So yes, please get <laughs> get Wong out of the um, out of the the source the out of his uh, office for a while and get him drunk. Oh sure. God, yes. Uh, a little short aside. Uh, Randall uh, had a student back in the day and was a colleague of mine. His name was Logan Rathbone. He does the music for this podcast, and I'm sure he's not listening to it. So I can. You know, I, I can say without hesitation that uh, Logan loves karaoke. So I've been to many karaoke nights with Logan back in the day. So uh, yeah, it's good stuff. I, I have I have not had the opportunity to go to Japan yet to train, but I have heard stories about um, you know post class karaoke nights, and if your if the microphone is passed to you, you kind of have to go. <laughs> There's no gay out of it. There's no gay out of it, especially if the if the Shihan uh, passes the mic to you. Yeah, so I've done karaoke three times in my life, and it's always a crash and burn. I haven't done it in 20 years because I finally learned my lesson. But uh, yeah, I tried one song. It was horrible, right? Ten years pass, and I have to go up to karaoke. I tried the same song. Why? I have no idea. I just did it, and it was even worse. <laughs> and literally, by the time I got to the second sentence, I realized. I picked the same song when I really crashed and burned like 15 years earlier. What am I doing? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, Joel, if 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 you get down if you get down here for celebration, you know, we may have to, you know, do the the celebration karaoke night or something. Yeah, and it was the unicorn song, by the way. It's an Irish thing. Okay. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> well, actually, the only uh, song I actually can do is "My Way" by Sid Vicious, or this other guy. That's only because I can yell out uh, the dialogue, and not really sing it. Okay. Oh dear. I digress. I digress. Uh, well, let me ask you this. There, there was a reference to this uh, movie from the 1960s in this film, uh, Planet of the Apes. Did anyone recall that? The whole acting thing with uh, 
Oh, right. Yeah, with, with Trevor Slattery. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. I love the whole Slattery character arc in this. Like, I, I love the, the behind the scenes reasons for having him in here behaving like he's behaving. Like, we, we essentially want an official on film apology for the uh, um, having a, a guy adopt Asian stereotypes in an impersonation and, and to just bring it out full like in, in front of everyone and have him like downright apologize for the whole thing, have him this reformed <laughs> character who's gone to prison and come out better and uh, um, just make them all around. And also dopey as all hell. Like they, they were monkeys acting. Um, I just thought that it was really well done. And I loved his relationship with Morris. I just thought that whole character arc was, was perfectly done. You know, because, you know, Ben Kingsley, not a bad actor. Yeah, yeah, he's won an yeah. award or two on his day. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just the fact, like, you know, he plays dead during that attack, right? Okay, I'm acting, I'm playing dead. <laughs> That's, <laughs> what a, like, he's well, a dunce. So interesting yeah. to have him to, to be apologizing for adopting an Asian stereotype um, when he was being the Mandarin, um, when Ben Kingsley, of course, most famously played Gandhi, um, a Southeast Asian man, and uh, as a white guy playing that, um, which would be much more problematic if something like that were to happen today. I actually read that he is, uh, I believe he's half Indian. I think he's half English, half Indian. Yeah. Yeah. Is he? Yeah, he is of yeah. Indian yep. descent. Yeah. So it's not well, then I bad. take it all back. I did <laughs> not know that. <laughs> yeah. My favorite laugh of the entire movie is we just had this dark scene where uh, Shang-Chi and gets captured by his evil father and, you know, they get thrown down in the dungeon and then they meet uh, Trevor, and then all of a sudden, this headless, flying, furry monster comes around the corner, and they're like, "What the hell is that?" Because, like, I mean, like that was, you know, like no one was expecting that to happen. Like, it was like a, a relatively grounded movie at that point, and then this weird monster just like <laughs> runs around the corner all of a sudden, and they're freaking out. And Trevor's like, "Oh, thank God, you can see him too." <laughs> well, I mean, it, it was pretty much established. Um, in Iron Man 3 that, that Trevor is um, not exactly sober and probably <laughs> treated on something. So whatever whatever drugs he's been doing, he, he was doing um, and got off of probably, um, you know, contributed to his uh, psychosis yeah. or what have you. I just Googled Bed Kingsley after the great revelation that he's actually uh, uh, half Indian. And his, his name is Krishna Pandit Banji, is the name he was born with. I genuinely thought he was a, a white British dude playing playing an Indian in that movie and that that would be a big problem now. But shows what a good actor he is. Yeah. <laughs> me. He's convinced you he's been British this whole time. That's right. He's actually, uh, he plays an ape from this movie from the 60s called Planet of the Ape. No, forget it. Okay. <laughs> I like Wait, the, he was a bit, I, he wasn't playing of the Apes, was he? No, I'm just saying he was playing of the Apes. Ripping off the joke about a yeah, Planet yeah, of the Apes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. I, I, I'm mostly joking. <laughs> yeah, I actually like, uh, again, going back to Wong, the the final scene uh, just before the credits, so when uh, they're having their, uh, their uh, I don't know, their uh, double dates basically out to the restaurant when Wong shows up and says, come with me. You're like, and Wong shows up and downs the drink. <laughs> and pops up. Again, so, I, 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 like I said, I don't want to, I don't want to spoil Spider Man mm, because we're not even discussing yeah, that right now. But, but uh, you know, if I were in Wong's position and I were having to deal with uh, Doctor Strange, I would need a drink <laughs> or several. Hey, I'm not sure. Do you think uh, you know? First thing, this movie is Asian centric, which is great to see, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, to me, that's a great thing, and we need more. Uh, how did this uh, movie play out in Asia in real life in terms of uh, you know screen time and uh, you know uh, tickets to cinema? I don't know. I really, I really don't pay attention to how the how things how well things do. You know, yeah. because, generally, I'm not sure offhand because that's like the, the biggest thing with these big corporations like Disney is that they need to break into new markets to stay competitive. And Asia is a huge market, especially China. And it's gotten, I say, gotten to the stage. I'm not trying to put a value judgment on this, where uh, 
the uh, you know the filmmakers purposely will avoid dealing with certain issues or topics so that there'll be a, a greater release of the film. Mm. Yeah. So um, yeah, because you just look at Fight Club, they just changed the ending in Fight Club in China, right? And that that film has been out for like twenty odd years. Wait, wait, wait! How do they change the ending in Fight Club? Uh, so instead of the building being uh, spoiler alert, I should say. So the, the end scene, uh, scene where the building comes crashing down because I believe there was a bomb or something, some sort of explosion. Uh, uh -huh. the, there's actually just a insert a card saying that uh, the that bad guys are, have been arrested by the authorities. What? What? That's yeah, horrible. yeah. So that, that's that's, I, I that's guess, yeah. I guess they don't have as much crush, crushing debt in China as yeah. they do here. Yeah, there I go. But, uh, kind of like the ending of Holy Grail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, man. Uh, and so in answer to your question, in Hong Kong, the film produced the largest September opening weekend as well as the second best opening during the pandemic. That's not bad. What about in mainland China? It's not bad. Huh. Hmm. And how, how about Taiwan? Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. there's also... There's That's also a problem. So we, we just, we just, been, we just got censored um, from China. They can't okay? mention yeah. because mm. they don't want to piss off China yeah. would mostly do the Taiwan. See uh, yeah. John Cena's apology for referring to Taiwan as a, it's, it's, as an independent yeah. country. It's a touchy place in the world in terms of geopolitics, right? And, and it's a problem for storytelling uh, tellers if you want to get your content uh, you know, shown there. Yeah. Interesting times. Uh, we can talk about it here. We even talked about Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> against the world. <laughs> Oh, God. Oh, this is great. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, so there's going to be a sequel. Uh, they already announced that. They announced it at the end of this film, and they announced it later on. Uh, this film, the first one is actually filmed in Sydney, Australia, which is kind of cool. Uh, this uh, village that they, they, uh, they film, uh, Talu, Talu, is they actually built, they built a physical set. They actually built these structures, you know, for filming purposes, but still, it's kind of cool. Cool. And uh, I wonder what's uh, the second one's going to be uh, involved with. I think, uh, like, if you listen to the gossip and the, the speculation, that it's going to be tied into this whole multiverse uh, war that's coming to the MCU somehow. Possibly. Yeah. Possibly, but you also have you also got to wonder what what um, that's going to be up to if that's going to be something that is involved with the sequel or if that's going to, you know, filter out throughout the, um, the rest of the Marvel universe. Yeah. There's a rumor that the sister whose name I forget is going to get her own Disney plus series about her leading the 10 rings. So that would be cool. Know. Oh yeah. yeah the, and the whole, you know, uh, post post credit scene with the, the headquarters of the, the 10 rings, right. It was some, uh, mm -hmm. cosmic, uh, uh, cosmetic changes. Let's just say that. Some, cosmetic. Uh, yeah, cosmetic changes. Uh, that was kind of cool. Yeah, girl power. That's cool. Yeah. yeah, I'm for that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, her father wouldn't let her train uh, with the boys, so she's definitely making up for that. Yeah. Yeah. Good to see. It. That was another strength of this movie. There were a lot of strong uh, women's roles in it, kind of like Black Panther. So even though it started, mm -hmm. dude, there were he was surrounded by a very strong supporting cast of women who had lots of interesting character arcs and powers and stuff. Mm -hmm. And wicked cool rope darts. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what did you guys think of the Mandarin's arc, specifically about how he was ultimately being manip mentally manipulated by the soul sucker, and that you know he was kind of ultimately a victim because he was being brainwashed into thinking that he was saving his wife when he was really unleashing this monster. Because I, I didn't like that. I was very excited that they were introducing the Mandarin into the MCU and that he was going to be this new ultimate villain. And in the end, I think they went too far into making him sympathetic and that he was ultimately, I mean, he was, he was, he was a victim in this movie, really. He was being mind controlled and I thought that really kind of ruined the threat and the potential of the character. And then he just got killed off, too. So I, I found that disappointing as much as I enjoyed him being in it. I, I think that I think that feeds into like like kind of like a strong like you have a strong man trope where it's like, yeah, he's he's you know, he 
plays at being the tough guy, but you know, he has a weakness and if, if, and that weakness can be exploited because it's easy to exploit someone who has, who pretends to have no weaknesses, but really does yeah. or really does. And so. he probably had a very small penis and he hasn't used it in a while. And I'm saying that because, you know, he's, he's compensating. That's what he's trying to do. And it's easy. To I, I mean, that. I wasn't, I wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna go, you know, go full out there, but okay, sure. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I did. That, okay. that if that, if, you know, if it, if it works. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, this is the this is the only woman he's ever been in love with. So, you know, he's experienced. This is like the first time he's really experienced, like, you know, love. And, you know, that was taken away from him by by his enemies because he thought he put away the thing that that, you know, made him invincible. And it, it kind of that, I mean, that kind of goes back to what what Tony Stark said to to um, Peter Parker in the first Spider-Man movies, like if you think you need the suit in order to be who you are, then you don't. Then you shouldn't have the suit. You know? So you know if if you know when Wu thinks that he needs the rings to to be the strong guy and to protect his family, then he really shouldn't have the rings to begin with. And also, he was willing to sacrifice his children just to get with his uh, deceased wife. What does that tell you? Right. Yeah. Right. That. Uh, that tells me his priorities aren't where he or probably weren't where they should be. Maybe I did think the backs. Sorry, Randall, go ahead. I said maybe they were bad kids. I was just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Randall, we've but seen don't... both of his kids. They are they are perfectly fine. Well, he did forbid the girl from training, and she kept doing it. So yeah, yeah. yeah she knew she told. Hey, him. hey, that is you not be a bad seed. Come on. Also, the the little boy was supposed to murder someone, and he didn't. He just ran away instead. He's no, a horrible he did. son. No, he did he murder someone. Oh, that's he, what he, he did. did. Yeah. And then, yeah. So, oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, but don't worry about him being killed, Derek, because they can always just pull a Palpatine and say, "Oh, it turns out he was alive the whole time for yeah. some reason." <laughs> Yeah. You know, I it just occurred to me now a, a better way to have ended this would have been that you, you stick with everything up until the ending where, you know, he he used to be a bad guy and then he fell in love and it redeemed him. And then when she died, he was just like, you know, fuck the world. And he decides to go back to being evil again. And then he gets mentally manipulated to unleash the soul sucker. But rather than just getting killed off, he should they should have had the moment where he realizes he was being manipulated and then he gets pissed off and he teams up with his son to fight the soul sucker. And then at the end of the movie, they basically part ways knowing that they're going to be enemies in the future. I think that would have been a much better way to end it. Mm. And it, and it would have, uh, you know, would have retained his, uh, his, his power and threat and kept him around as a character. Well, I mean, that also feeds into Marvel's villain problem, which is they keep killing off their villains. Yeah. Which is, you know, except for Loki, which, Loki isn't really a villain. He's more of an anti-hero. So, yeah it's, yeah, it's a shame they didn't keep him around because, like I said, the Mandarin is one of, like, the top five MCU villains in the comic books. So to just off him after a single movie is disappointing. Yeah, I had no particular feelings about the Mandarin from the comic books. Um, weirdly enough, I, I read comic books my whole life. I was not an Iron Man fan until suddenly he was embodied by Robert Downey Jr. And then I just loved him. I thought he was fantastic. Um, but in the comics, I was like, yeah, he, all his powers come from his suit, whatever. Um, and uh, I didn't much care for him. So the Mandarin, was he did not feature prominently. Whereas in the comic books, I loved the Fantastic Four. And every movie that has attempted to feature the Fantastic Four, it's wah, wah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> But maybe uh, this yeah. time around they'll get it right. Yeah, that would be lovely. But I, I didn't have uh, particular feelings about the Mandarin surviving this movie or not. Um, and they sort of uh, he was sort of half Mandarin, right? Because they they blended him with the, the character from the end uh, from the comics who had been Shang-Chi's actual father, who was also mm -hmm. a blend of old Dr. Fu Manchu. And so he was this sort of quasi Mandarin mixture of a bunch of characters. And then he we didn't really get to see how he would turn out if mm -hmm. left to govern his own affairs right this is a villain that they've been setting up since the very first mcu movie in iron man though because the the terrorists that iron man fights in that very first movie are the 10 rings organization mm -hmm. so they well, they've been setting this guy up since day one 
Except I don't know how you know granular one. I don't know how granularly he's involved with you know the operation, the daily operation of the Ten Rings. This also could have been this Iron Man one could have also taken place during the time when he was um, retired, you know, and not living, not in charge. And then Iron Man three sets up the possibility that. It might not have been Wen Wu running the Ten Rings. It might have been um, someone else at the time. I've just so. realized now how it's all going to turn out. In the end, it's all going to have been Palpatine the whole time. Of course. <laughs> or, or you know, the, the the joke has been made that you know everything is everything is all the fault of Mephisto, and Mephisto is eventually going to show up and and fuck everyone over. Yeah, but an MCU Star Wars crossover, it could happen. Maybe. I mean, when, when they get desperate enough to need more money. Yeah. <laughs> Aren't they all on Disney now? <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, Disney owns both the uh, franchises. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Yes. Yeah. Boom. Done. All right. So, uh, any last uh, thoughts before we close the doors and uh, get this podcast out uh, as soon as possible? <laughs> so, in terms you- of having the big final battle being with CGI monsters, uh, Carrie, you were in favor of that. Any, anybody else? I was kind of like warm. Fine with it. I, I was well, okay. My, my, I hate that, but in this movie, I didn't care because of the way the story worked. Um, mm-hmm. I, like th- there was enough narrative holding everything together, and enough, you know, love for the characters that, you know, you can have CGI going on in the background, but where that's the whole resolution of the plot, and that's the bit you care about, no matter like which pixels beat up which other pixels, and that's all that matters in the end. I hate that, but that didn't happen here. The, the pixels fighting the pixels were were secondary to the, the the small movements of the soul happening within each character. See, I, I would have liked it if the ending was the one that, you know, is just the Mandarin's army shows up, the Taolin army is here, and it's people fighting people. I think that would have been a perfectly satisfactory ending. And, you know, the, the dragons were cool, but then having all the little, like, invisible vampire bats flying around, I, I thought that was where it kind of got a little too uh, reverting to type. Too sucky for you? <laughs> <laughs> they, they should have had Gungan versus Droid. Oh, yeah. God, yeah, yeah. That's the good uh, stuff. Dear Lord, dear Lord. Uh, the Randa- original CGI mm. pixelated <laughs> army. <laughs> Yeah, let's just clone a copy of them, I'm sure. Uh, Randall, any last thoughts, sir? No, I just, I, I really enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed it as an excuse also to get together with you guys today and record this. That was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And uh, um, I, I hadn't expected anything from this, except for I, I knew that I quite liked the, the main actor. Um, and uh, I thought it was super cool how he just sort of sprung this whole movie into being by a pure act of will. And uh, um, and it seems from all accounts that it you know couldn't happen to a nicer guy. So I uh, I thoroughly enjoyed this. Excellent. It's always great to have you on, sir. Uh, you know you bring uh, uh, insights, and uh, we'll see you next time, hopefully. So there's that. Uh, Carrie, any last thoughts before we close our doors? No, this was a this is a fun movie. I uh, I can't wait to see what this does with the um, what the MCU as a whole and where the next movie goes. Fantastic. Great. Yes. All right. Plus, plus we have, we have Michelle Yeoh now in the MCU. So, you know, that is, that is awesome. <laughs> She's already in guardians too. Oh, that's true. That's true. Never mind. Hmm. Anyway, I would watch a movie where she played all the parts though. <laughs> and, any good. opportunity to get Michelle Yeoh uh, in front of our eyeballs is a, is a great thing. Uh, Fantastic. Oh, as they say in German, fantastisch. Okay, uh, this show is released as a podcast and on YouTube. Subscribe today and check out our Discord. It's a great way to keep up to date with all the science fiction and geek news, culture news you need in your life. It's like I'm reading a script or something. All right, so a Discord (laughs) server, you can find our invites wherever you find our social media, which are Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I do the Twitter and Instagram, and Derek does the Facebook. Derek, you're doing a great job, man. Thank you. Our email is at, and the email address is management at sci fi podcast.space. Carrie, what is your Twitter handle? My Twitter handle is Carrie Blackfire42. That's K E R I Blackfire42. And what other podcasts are you on? 
I am also on DC Talk, Cape Chronicles, and Enter the Dojo. And we actually did uh, do an episode on Shang-Chi back in uh, December. So check that out. And that's on the Random Chatter Network? On the Random Chatter Network, yes. Excellent. Derek, what's your Twitter address? I'm at DerekJBB. And my website is DerekBB.com, which I am updating now. Yes, please check out Derek's uh, website. He's uh, he's trying, really trying hard to get published more and get his writing out there. So uh, we support creative endeavors on the show and drinking. And tell them about your OnlyFans page. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Can we not? <laughs> that's that's Delicia BB. Oh, God. Delicia <laughs> underscore BB. <laughs> All right, uh, Randall, where can people find you on Twitter? Uh, on Derek's OnlyFans page. <laughs> oh, no, <I'm> <laughs> <laughs> He's my only Randall. gold platinum subscriber. <laughs> at Randall oh, underscore God. Graham, in fact. All right, and you're the author of two novels, Before Life and Afterlife Crisis, so a drink twice. And the third one is in the copy editing stage right now, Nether Regions, which comes out in September. Great. Uh, we are looking forward to that. Um, because I'm sure I'm not going to be busy at all in September of 2022. I will have lots of time to, to read your book. <laughs> well, technically, it'll be up to me. Oh, yeah, exactly. True. You can just assign it. <laughs> I still have to do your Wikipedia page, man. It's, uh, it's on my to-do list. Okay. <laughs> anyway, which way, uh, I'm on Twitter at Joel underscore Welch. It's closing time. Take care. Please make it home safely. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Uh, Bye. Everybody. Music provided courtesy of Logan Rathbone. Podcast logo by Duran. Copyrighted Joe Welch. Listen responsibly. And we can't wait for your next visit to our fine establishment. Cheers.